Um, Brett gave us the privilege of choosing whatever we wanted to preach on this morning. So I was really uh, going back and forth between should I preach on like Psalm 119, have us read the whole passage, or maybe the book of Revelation, you know, something like that, something super easy. Um, I chose something different. So if you want to, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. I know that we just got out of the gospel, but you can never tire of Jesus. And uh, so we're going to be there this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at a few verses Um, uh, 38 through 42, and I chose this because this is one of my favorite gospel accounts, and it's something that I need to be reminded of um, in various seasons of my life, and hopefully God's Spirit will use it in yours as well, whatever season of life you find yourself in today. And it's funny how as you're studying for a passage as a preacher, um, God uses that same passage, that same message to convict your own life, and uses it to teach you um, something, and uh, as long as you're listening to God, that is. And so I want to talk to you this morning about a consistent and daily temptation that I found myself in uh, as I was studying for this message. This last week, I felt the pressure of a full week, and I'm sure that you have from time to time, if it's not maybe every week, you feel like there are not enough hours in the day right? You feel like you've got a never-ending to-do list. list, You feel the pressure, whether it be classwork, if you're in college, or if you're a parent, you've got kids, you've got to get them to school, you've got to pick them up from school, you've got all the activities that come with that. Whatever it might be, I'm sure that you guys have felt what it's like to have a full day, and then the full day repeats itself, and it ends up being a full week or a full month, right? And it just never feels like it ends. And I'm not saying that full days are not good or full weeks are not good. We look at work. God gave us work before the fall. Before we ever ate from the tree, God gave us work to do. That there is something beneficial and God-given and something that delights our heart when we work. Um, But um, what can happen is we can start going into a dangerous place if we're not careful. And so... What I want to talk about today is where where is God in the context of a busy week? I look at my schedule and I think, man, I don't know how I'm going to fit this all in. I've got to study for the the sermon I'm giving this morning. I've got worship stuff to prepare for and, and all that. How am I going to fit this in? And then we wonder... And we, we see our Bible on the shelf, or we see the chair where we normally sit to pray, and like, I don't have time for that. I've got too much other stuff to do. And then we end up neglecting something that is very, I would say, vitally important to our lives. So here's the temptation I faced in a nutshell. I'm too busy doing stuff for God that I don't have time to spend with Him. Now, I know that you guys aren't pastors, but the same applies for you. You can get so busy doing stuff and doing stuff for God that you neglect your relationship with him. And here's what I'd like to argue for today. Today I'm telling you that it's more important to spend time with God than it is to do stuff for God. And I believe that the inverse of this, putting stuff, putting to-do lists before our God, is a killer of our spiritual relationship. It's a killer of our spiritual vitality, and it plays right into our fallen condition and yours too. See, it's easier to do stuff for God and for people than to actually spend time with people. Relationships are hard work. Relationships take take time. They take energy. They take vulnerability. And the same thing applies to your God as well. Now, we all know the difficulty of having a relationship with one another. I'm sure that you've felt that. But any relationship is hard work. Tasks, they're clean cut. Relationships are squishy, ambiguous. Tasks usually have a clear beginning and a clear end. I know when I'm done with it. I love lists, and I'm a list maker, and I love crossing stuff off my list. But relationships are not that way. Relationships, by nature, require two or more people, and the tasks are task, all I have to do is just focus on me. And as an introvert, that's really appealing, right? 
But this mentality can create pride. It can create a sense of, I don't need God or I don't need his people. And that's a very dangerous place to be. So we start focusing on tasks to the exclusivity of relationships. And then we start finding our identity, who we are and what we produce, rather than who we are in relationships and primarily our relationship with God. I'm a believe, I believe that I'm not alone. I believe that you struggle with it too. And honestly, if we look at our culture, I love America, but I see that this plays out in our culture. That we define ourselves by what we do and what we produce. Um, we praise the individual who's pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and accomplished so much. I think of the movie The Pursuit of Happiness. I, I really like that movie. I love Will Smith. But that is quintessential American ideology. We, we praise organizations that turn a profit every year. There's nothing wrong with that, but we have a tendency of idolizing them. Or we admire, I admire the pastor of the church with the most in attendance, I'll be honest. That's hard not to do. So we take pride in how much we're doing. I think of college students. Um, it can become a matter of pride. Oh, I only slept three hours last night. Oh, I only slept two, right? Because he had so much to do. Or parents, I've got my kid in this and this and this program all at the same time, right? Like how much can we cram into a second grader's life? Or those retired, this is what I did with my life. This is not, or not, this is who I was, or this is who I built my life around or with. And I feel all of this in the Pacific Northwest, which I understand is one of the most relaxed cultures in the States. I can't imagine what it's like on the East Coast. And maybe some of you who have lived in the East Coast can attest to that, right? We see this mentality spelled out in popular book titles, and yes, I'm embarrassed to say most of these I have read. Um, getting Things Done, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Smarter, Faster, Better. And this is my favorite. I haven't read this one. I'm slightly tempted to. Uh, the Productivity Ninja. I mean, it has ninja in the title. And so this popular mentality inadvertently and subconsciously gets carried over into our relationship with Christ, whether we like it or not. It's pervasive. And it subtly influences the way we think. We start to think, maybe not explicitly, but certainly implicitly, God only loves me because of what I do, not because of who I am in Jesus. Or if I sin, or if I don't read my Bible or pray today, I fear his rejection. Or, on the converse side, and that's like maybe you did read your Bible today, you say, if I'm doing all the right things, I feel good about myself, and I feel proud. And then I start to compare myself to others, which I'll have you know is a sure sign of pride when you start comparing yourself to others. But here I say again, being with Christ is more important than doing for Christ. God cares much more about who we are, who you are, than what you do. And some of you may say at this point, but wait, God cares about what I do. The Bible is a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. Part of that I agree with. Yes, God certainly does care about what I do. I'm not arguing that he doesn't, but what I am arguing for, that God has priorities, and we're going to look at these priorities today. So, once again, we're in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Get a drink of water here, and I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you care about us and you care about a relationship. And I'm thankful for all the people here in this room who also care about you and care about a relationship with you and a relationship with each other. God, I pray that as we open your word that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and that hearts that want to be obedient to your word. We come to you in your son's precious name. We all said, amen. Let's read together. Like I said, 10, Luke 10, 38 through 42, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted 
with much serving. And she went up to him, being Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, so it's worth noting, uh, obviously we're jumping in right into the middle of Luke's gospel account of the life of Jesus. And it's really important whenever we do that. So we, when we go through the book of Mark, I mean, we started from beginning to end, which is great. We understand the context. But I want to explain the context to you here in the Gospel of Luke because we can't just rip Scripture out and, uh, and uh, apply it, talk about it, whatever, without it being in context. So what comes immediately before this, you may notice in your Bible, is the story of the Good Samaritan, a, very, a fairly well-known, uh, probably one of the most well-known parables of Jesus. And what comes after this section is Jesus' teaching on prayer. Now, all of this is important. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to it later. But just know that we're jumping into the middle of Luke. What comes before this is the Good Samaritan. What comes after this is the teaching on prayer. But coming back to this account, we see Jesus. He's going on his way. He comes into a village. And a woman named Martha welcomes him into her home. And now this woman, Martha, has a sister called Mary. And we see a stark difference between them, right? And now is this pretty typical of sisters, or, or is it just me? This idea of um, you have Martha, who is type A. You have Mary, who is much more relaxed. You have Martha, who's this go-getter, who gets things done. I'm serving. I'm doing this stuff. You have Mary says, I'm, I'm good. You have Martha, who may seem uptight to a few of you. You are probably the Marys. Mary, I'm just here to have a good time. This is a classic dynamic of sisters. If you haven't read the Birth Order book by Kevin Lehman, super fascinating. But it totally nails my wife and um, my sister-in-law to a T. They're both amazing. But uh, my sister-in-law, who's older, is Martha, and my wife is Mary. Now, that may resonate with you. All of the Marthas in the room, the Marys drive you crazy. And all of the Marys, you wonder why the Marthas are so stressed out right? Um, if I was to pick between the two, I am a Martha. I'm type A. I like having lists. I like having things to do. But I'd like to point first to Mary's response to Jesus. And what does it say about her? Let's read it. It says, she sat at the Lord's feet listening, listening to what he had to say. This is a posture of, submiss of submission. This is a posture of learning. This is a posture of, I don't know it all. You are smarter than me. I'm going to humble myself before you and listen to what you have to say because I know that you have the words of life. And this is the proper posture that we are supposed to have towards Jesus. That we take God's word to be true. Everything it says about Jesus and everything that Jesus said, we believe to be true and we submit ourselves to it. It is one of learning. It is one of soaking it in. And this is what we do with smart people just innately, right? If you could think of the smartest person that you know right now, and let's say even dead or alive, and you were to take them out for coffee, would you spend all the time, uh, all your guys' time together doing the talking or would you be asking them a billion questions? Would you be spending your time listening to what they had to say? So the same applies with Jesus. And in fact, we believe that Jesus was the smartest person who ever lived. He's the very word of God incarnate. And so our proper posture as Christians, as brothers and sisters, followers of Jesus, is to sit at his feet and listen to what he has to say. Now, we do this now by spending time in his word. We believe this to be the word of God, divinely inspired, as Second Timothy says. And so we submit our lives to it, and we come and listen to it. So let me remind you, though, that being with Christ is more important than doing for Christ. I'm going to say that a lot this morning. So we've looked at Mary. Let's look at Martha. I'd like to read verse 40 again. 
But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. You can see Martha's getting angry. She's feeling slighted. She's feeling neglected. I want to ask the question, though, is Martha doing bad things? No. She's not. Is she sinning? No. Is she being disobedient to Jesus? No. She's serving Jesus. And all of the things that she's doing are good. But I would say that if we were there, we would probably be inclined to help Martha, not sit with Mary. We would probably get frustrated with Mary. And we would think that Martha is doing the best thing serving Jesus. And as a matter of fact, she thinks she's doing the best thing as well. And because of this, I believe we see a bit of a self-righteous attitude. I'm serving the Lord. He's come to my house. Not just anybody's house, but my house. And then we see this in how she speaks to Jesus. She's definitely a confident woman. <laughs> Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? She's being honest with him. Tell her then to help me. She starts to boss him around, and I find this funny that in our doing for Jesus, we can get so frustrated with Jesus. Now, the, the irony in that, in our doing for Jesus, we can get so frustrated with Jesus. We think, Lord, what the heck? I'm doing all of this for you. The least that you could do is bless me. The least that you could do is make my life a little bit easier. Why is it so difficult? Why am I so frustrated? If you only helped me, this ministry, this job, this whatever would be going well. I've done all this stuff for you. But that's not how Luke describes the situation. How does Luke describe the situation? He uses one word, and it's distracted. Martha is distracted with what? With serving, with serving Jesus. And she's missing the point. We start to think that doing for Christ is more important than being with him. Let's look at Jesus' response. Verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. His first words are Martha, Martha, and you can hear the love and the compassion in his voice. I don't think that this was a strong rebuke. I don't think he raised his voice, certainly didn't yell, but what you see is Jesus tenderly and compassionately come to Martha and respond to her with tender and loving care. He shows compassion towards her, and he shows the same compassion towards us. When we get so busy, he comes to me and he says, Lou, Lou, why are you so distracted? When we get frustrated with Jesus, we start bossing him around. You see his patience. You see the patience and the love of God displayed, just like he did with Mary. He tells her that she is anxious and troubled. The ESV translates this word as anxious. The NIV and the NASB translate this word as worried. And it's used 19 times throughout the New Testament. And the semantic range can vary from all the way from, uh, like what we talked about, anxious or worried. But the meaning of the word can also mean to have care or concern. Okay, All the ways that it's used in the New Testament. It is used a number of times. Uh, in Jesus' famous Matthew 6 discourse concerning anxiety, if you are a person who struggles with anxiety, I would recommend you spending time in that passage. It is also used in 1 Corinthians 7, and it's interesting, this is used in this context to describe a man's divided interest between the Lord and his wife. Nothing sinful about it, but once a man gets married, he has to be concerned with his wife and his kids. That's the same word that's used here. And so distracted. The other word 
used to describe Mary is used only one time, and it's here. It can mean upset or bothered. It conveys disorder. It conveys chaos. It conveys troubled or distracted. A mind or a life in a state of disorder or chaos. Have you experienced that? Uh, an apt expression is like a chicken with its head cut off. Now, have you ever seen a chicken with its head cut off? I have. I'd like to share a story. <laughs> so I want to preface the story. I'm not a hunter. I don't have any adverse feelings to killing animals. I just have never done it. Well, that's not true. I did it once, and it was kind of on accident. It was with a BB gun and a bird. And I was wee little, and um, yeah, I cried afterward. So... Um, so keep this all in mind. I'm being really vulnerable to you guys right now. Um, so my wife and I, we recently purchased a home here in Eugene, and one of the selling features was the big backyard, which in Eugene is kind of hard to find. And um, this yard has a whole bunch of mature trees. It has a grape trellis and um, um, a whole bunch of what are the raised beds for, yeah, for gardening. And then it also had a chicken coop. I've never raised chickens. Um, I'm not sure if my wife has, but we figured they're pretty self-sufficient, right? All you need to do is give them food and water, and then they give you stuff. They give you eggs. Sounds like a pretty good deal. So we thought it might be nice to have some eggs. One day my in-laws come to visit, and I was off doing something, but my wife and the, the family were with my in-laws, and uh, when I come home, unbeknownst to me, they decided to buy some chickens. So now I have chickens. And um, they're baby chickens. They're chicks. They're really cute. Um, I also am not a big fan of chickens, so every time I would look at the chicks, I'd be like, you're going to turn into something that terrifies me slightly, and I don't want to be around. Um, so they bought seven chicks. Um, okay, no, no problem. My in-laws are great. They also bought us the stuff to keep them all alive, like the food and the heat lamp and all this stuff, which is awesome. But there's a problem here. In my neighborhood, in this cul-de-sac, there's a ton of cats. And you can see where this is going. Our chicks get older, but they're not quite old enough to protect themselves from a full-grown cat. Now, I know I've come to understand that when chickens are fully grown, they can fend for themselves. A cat is not going to come after a chicken. But... When they're like a teen chicken, they're fair game. And so one day, I don't remember, we came home and uh, we walked outside and I see feathers everywhere. And I start counting the chickens. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I'm missing one. Upset that one got eaten, but glad that at least we still have six. So plenty of eggs. <laughs> um, but then my children start congregating around one of the chickens. Mm -hmm. And it's acting weird, and as in really not acting, like having a hard time breathing and just laying on the ground. Um, and so I go over to it, and I'm looking at it, and the chicken has been mortally wounded. I mean, I'm no vet, but it's like I don't have any hope of this thing surviving. And at this point, the whole family has come out, and all five of us are just standing around this dying chicken. And my children keep asking me, what, what's wrong with the chicken, Daddy? I'm like, oh, man. So, so we're all standing around this chicken, and then I'm looking at Brianna, and Brianna looks at me, and she's like, you've got to put this thing out of its misery. Like, it's just that look, right, all husbands can attest to. And I'm thinking, great, how am I going to do this? We just moved in. I have nothing save a small axe for chopping firewood. And it's, not, it's, it's fairly dull. Um, this is my nightmare. Um, so it's dull. It's small. The blade is barely the width of the chicken's neck. So I have to have pretty good aim. Now, everybody in this room right now is probably thinking, just wring its neck. Yes, I know. Not helpful then. Okay? I did not know to do that. 
and I'm probably the only one in Eugene who didn't know how to kill a chicken. So here I am, the man of my house, my wife and my children next to me, staring at this chicken who is slowly dying. So I walk over to the shed. I get my axe, hating every moment. I get my gloves because I don't know how this is going to go down. I've never done this before. And I take the chicken and I put the chicken on the stump. We have this old stump there. And I know that I have one shot to do this. Just one. Sorry if this is getting too graphic. It's going to end soon. I have one shot to do this. I'm making a point here. Um, so I put the chicken on the stump. I'm kneeling over. I'm trying to aim this right. I have a few false starts. Bree is watching. Um, and and then I, we sent Eva and Ezra inside because we weren't quite ready for that. But Brianna and Noah were still outside with us. Um, I should have just called Ray. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, finally, I work up the courage and I make the strike. And wouldn't you know it, I miss. And I only partially sever the chicken's head. And as you can imagine, chaos ensues. The chicken goes crazy. It erupts from the stump. I have no idea what is happening. I'm taken aback. Moments before, it was relatively peaceful and calm. And now, in a split second, it's the whole world has turned upside down. Total panic. It's, it's jumping. It's running. It's flopping all over the place, flailing. It is utter pandemonium. And then it starts to come after my wife. <laughs> she jumps out of the way. And then I remember looking over, and I see Noah. And Noah is just like dumbfounded. He's just like, like, what is going on? And I'm like, I don't know. What is going on, Noah? And it was like slow motion. It was, it was this moment of, I see Noah. The half-severed chicken sees Noah. And he starts to come after him. And I'm like, get Noah, get him out of the way. And Brianna manages to grab him and, you know, he was saved. Anyways. So, 30 seconds, sheer chaos, I ended up grabbing the chicken and I completed the job. So I'm a man now. And, um, but what is my point with this story? Worry and anxiety cause us to act like that chicken. If you can have that image in your mind, when you are worried, when you are anxious, when you are distracted, it causes you to act like a chicken with its head cut off. You become worried and chaotic and distracted in your thoughts and your mind, and then it plays out in how you live your life. So let me turn this around. What are you worried or anxious about this morning? What has gotten you divided in interest, thought, or mind? What are you feeling disordered, chaotic or troubled about? Even as I ask that question, I know things are coming to your mind. Each and every one of us, I'm sure. It could be, what am I going to do about my job? What am I going to do about my children? My marriage, my schooling, my health. These are not small things at all. I don't mean to make light of them. But what I want to say is, just as Jesus compassionately came to Martha, he compassionately responds to us as well. And he uses one word, and it's the word needed. He comes to us and he tells us what is needed for our life, what is essential. So Martha was not doing evil. We've already established that. Someone's got to make the meal, right? People are hungry. But Jesus has priorities, and if we're followers of Jesus, now we do too. His priorities should be our own. So here's our priorities. Relationship with God first. Doing stuff for God second. But maybe you're a Martha like me. You get distracted too easily or anxious too quickly. And I've always got to have stuff that I need to do. My wife can attest to that. But Jesus comes to us and compassionately says, choose what is essential. Come and spend time with me. But then I think, man, my day is already too full. But do I really not have the time? 
How much time have I spent in front of the television? How much time have I spent in front of my phone? How much time have I spent in front of the computer or pursuing my hobbies that I really don't have time to spend with God? And I don't say that to shame you or myself, but the truth is, if we were to honestly look at how we spend our time, I just, I wonder, would we really not have time for God? And if that's the case, then maybe we need to put some stuff out of our life if we're just too busy. Okay. So remember how I mentioned it's important to keep this account in context. What came before this is the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, um, uh, if you recall, it's a parable of Jesus. There was a man going from one town to another. He is um, he's robbed and he's beaten. He's left for dead. And uh, three people go before him, walk before him, the religious elite essentially, and they don't want to have anything to do with him. And then a good Samaritan who um, were not looked at too fondly in that time take him to a, a hotel and they pay for all of his medical expenses, right? Thus displaying the love of God. That story is all about our actions. It's all about our doing, how we should live as Christians. The good Samaritan didn't just believe that it was good to help people. He acted on it. So actions and deeds are important, and what we do is important. But yet, I want to remind you, too, what comes after this section. It's a teaching on prayer. A teaching on how to be with the Heavenly Father. And that this account of Mary and Martha is sandwiched between the two. Doing on one end and being with on the other. And here's why I think so. Your being will take care of your doing. Who you are will take care of what you do. And so then it's really important who you are is greater than what you do. Because what flows from your heart is what you do. It's what you say. It's what you think. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance." We ask the question, why? Thankfully, the author answers, for, flum it, for, for from it flow the springs of life. The springs of life are what we think, say, and do. And he tells us to keep our heart with all vigilance. A tree will be known by its fruit. Sean quoted that last week. We cannot help producing what we are. An apple tree produces apples. It cannot change that. It cannot produce grapes no how, matter how hard it tries. And I don't know about you, but I want to be like Jesus. So it's funny, or the question is then, how do I be like Jesus? And this is funny to me, but in a really cool way. So I believe God works providentially. In our staff meeting on Wednesday, the prayer team joined us, and that's led by Carol Lazar. Um, and she said this, and I want you to listen to this because this is essentially my sermon. She didn't know this. I hadn't told her what I was preaching on. But she said verbatim, if you want to be conformed to the image of Christ, you've got to sit at his feet. If you want to be conformed to the image of Christ, you've got to sit at his feet. That is literally my sermon. How cool is that? You've got to spend time with him if you want to be like him. And if you want to handle, handle life's difficulties like Jesus, who did it pretty well, you need to spend time with him. And if you notice, you're still doing something in this. You're still sitting at the master's feet but you're letting God change you from the inside out so that who you are and what you do and what you say is because Jesus is working in you by the power of his Holy Spirit. And you think of, uh, like I said, an apple tree. 
Does the apple tree try really hard to produce apples? Or does it just produce apples by extension of it being an apple tree? The same is true for us as Christians. We produce the fruit of the Spirit by being by spending time with Jesus. Certainly we make decisions. I'm not saying that we don't. But if you want to bear fruit, like an apple tree, you need to sink your roots in the soil of Jesus Christ and his word and spending time in prayer. So I'd like to give you a couple practical ways you can do this on a weekly basis. Preemptively, I know that if you've been in the church for any amount of time and the subject of devotionals or quiet time comes up, you can be like me and you can consciously or unconsciously just dismiss them. Many of us agree that we should be doing these things, but we don't. And I think um, sometimes that's just how the Christian life is. And what I mean by that is we know what we need to do. We just don't do it. And the pain, and until the pain of change is greater than the pain of staying the same, we won't do anything different. So I would encourage you, though, before life gets too difficult, to spend time and to do these practices that I would encourage you to do. But also, really quick, I want to say this. Um, my mentality is I can become very legalistic, and I can turn these practices in, in a way uh, to seek God's favor. But that's not what they are at all. They're simply ways of spending time with Jesus. They were practiced by Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the one who uses these times with the Father to make you more like him. It's like Romans 12.1, we renew our minds and we're transformed into the image of Christ by spending time with him. So, um, any of you who have been married for some time, you understand that being in relationships, they change you. And this is no different. The more time you spend with somebody, the more you become like them. That's why the book of Proverbs tells us not to associate with those given to anger, because we will become angry. And now I try to be flexible with these things as well. Um, I have come to understand that my relationship with my wife, and this would hold true for you as well if you're married or with those closest to you, the relationships that you have with those closest to you are a good barometer of your spiritual health. The reason why is because I am who I am with my wife. I'm the most vulnerable I am. I I don't have a problem displaying all of my sin with her, right? It's, it's proven that with those who we're closest with, we, we don't have a problem with displaying the anger that otherwise we try to hide. They, I mean, they know who we are. And so when I come home or when I'm grumpy, my wife has learned to ask me two questions. The first is, have you eaten anything? Because I do get hangry. Hangry, yes. And then the second question she asks is, have you spent any time with God? Because I can get spiritually hangry. And it's interesting to me that the Word of God is consistently referred to as bread. So I'm sure that you're like me, and it would do us good to spend time eating his word and devouring it. So I want to discuss two practices that have substantially affected my time with God. The first is prayer. I think prayer is important um, because Jesus believed it was important. It's also important to the gospel writer because immediately after this passage, remember, he starts talking about prayer. And when, gives, when Jesus gives a teaching on prayer, he doesn't command a certain day, time, extent, what have you. I think that's important to realize. He's just, he just simply says, when you pray, meaning that as a disciple of Christ, it is assumed that you will pray. So when you pray, here's how you should do it. So in times of prayer, you may be a morning person or an evening person. God doesn't care. You may like doing it during... Your lunchtime. I used to do that. I used to go for a walk on my lunchtime. God doesn't care. You might, you might like sitting in a chair. You might like kneeling. You might like going for a walk. None of those are more holy than others. He doesn't care about how we do it. You can even do it while you're driving. All he cares 
is that you're honest with him and that you're vulnerable. He cares more about the content than when or where or how. Now, I'd like to go to a portion of text from one of Paul's letters to describe what prayer should look like. The reason being is because that word anxiety or worry that is used 19 times is also used in this letter by Paul in the book of Philippians. It's found in Philippians chapter 4. And I want to give you guys, as you pray, a recipe for dealing with anxiety. And to simplify this, uh, I just want to give three things that I notice that are commanded in this passage. You can turn there if you'd like, Philippians 4, starting in verse 4, um, but I'll also read it here. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He says, Do not be anxious about anything. That's that word. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the three commands. Firstly, and I find this interesting, we are commanded to not worry. Do not be anxious. That's a command. A command implies a choice that we make. I know I've wrestled with this. How can that be? Anxiety just feels like it comes upon me. But I have to believe Scripture. When Scripture says that there's a command, that command implies that I have a choice to make. To not be anxious. Worry, then, is a choice. Secondly, we are to offer thanksgiving. There is something about giving thanks that kills anxiety, and this should come as no surprise, but um, I was reading a book this week, and it's by a secular researcher. She studies um, shame, and she talks about this idea of foreboding joy. And all that is is when you're happy, you immediately think, oh man, what's coming around the corner? When's the next shoe going to drop? A.K.A. anxiety. Anxiety. But her research has said that thanksgiving has a deadening effect on anxiety. Now, as a secular researcher, she wouldn't say that you should be thankful for God. You should just have a, an atmosphere or presence of thanksgiving, keep a journal, all that kind of stuff. But we, as Christians, know who to thank. We thank our Heavenly Father. So I'd say this, if you're anxious... Have plenty of time giving thanks. Thirdly, we are then to offer up our cares and our concerns and our anxieties to God. We are to bring all of them to Him. And I would say that you do this as often and as much as you have the fear. Because what I believe is that fear is an emotion, anxiety is an emotion, fear is a natural emotion. Anxiety is, I believe, that it's God's way of telling us that we have our trust misplaced. Okay? Anxiety, our heart is trying to tell us that our trust is not placed in the one who can truly deal with it. And so by praying, I want to tell you that prayer is an act of trust. Just the simple act of prayer is trusting. You're implicitly saying, God, you exist. God, you hear me. You care for me. And that you are powerful enough to do something. All of that is implied when you come to God with your cares and your anxieties and your concerns. God, you exist. You hear me. You're good. And you can deal with it. So I want to say that when you pray, you make a choice to not be anxious, to give thanks, and I would encourage you to pray as often as much as you have the fear. For me, I would say it's also helpful to set set aside a larger portion of time, uh, and I schedule it in my calendar sometimes. Um, Just like we would with any other relationship, when we put it in our calendar, uh, 
we, we know we're going to do it. Or at least we have more of a motivation to do it. So that's one side of being with Jesus. I want us to look at the other. Any good relationship is based on two-way dialogue. So prayer is us communicating to God, and God communicating to us is when we spend time in our Bible. And I would encourage you to do this. When you open your Bible, I want you to pray for God to open up your eyes to see the wonderful things that are in his word. And this, where I get this from is Psalm 119, verse 18. He says, I open my eyes. This is the psalmist praying to God. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The truth is, is that we need God to open our eyes to see the wonderful truths that are in his word. And when we pray that prayer, he will. I just read from Psalm 119, but that whole chapter are the benefits of spending time in God's word. There are many, but I want to give you three really quick. It brings you joy. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. He says it's like honey, that it's sweet, it's enjoyable, it's good. The second is it sustains in difficult times. Psalm 119, 72, or 92, I said, excuse me. Psalm 119, verse 92, If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. If it had not been for God's word, the author would have perished in his affliction. I know that I have been in times in my own life where the affliction has felt very great, and I would say that the only thing that got me through was spending time in God's word, memorizing it, meditating on it. And it's amazing what it does for you. I, I can't describe it. You just have to experience it for yourself. So I'd say is affliction comes to us all, but is God's word sustaining you or are you just grinning and bearing it? I would encourage you to go to God's word. Thirdly, finally, it brings wisdom and understanding. Psalm 119, starting in verse 97, says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now listen to this. Your commandment, or your word, makes me wiser than my enemies. The Lord is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Those are some pretty amazing promises. But that's what God's word says. That God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It brings life. It brings joy. It brings sustenance. It sustains you in difficult times. And it makes you wise. It makes you wise when you spend time meditating on it. So here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to meditate on Scripture. That sounds fancy. It's really not. All you're doing is you are trying to fill your mind with God's Word. And I liken this to a meal. Think of your favorite meal right now, whether it's pizza, steak, hamburger, the best thing that you've ever had. What do you do with that meal? Do you just eat it as quickly as possible? I would hope not. No, you savor it. You take every bite and you savor it. You take in the aroma, the taste, the texture. You ruminate it, ruminate on it. That is God's word. That's what we do with God's word. Just like you would with your favorite cheeseburger, you do that with God's word. You take it in. You meditate on it. You ponder it. You roll it over in your mind. You apply it to your life. You ask questions about it. That word, to meditate, literally means to mutter to yourself. You mutter God's word as you ponder it. And I would say... Spend time doing this, even considerable time. Meditation does not take time just for five minutes. It takes sitting at the feet of Jesus, and that, makes a, that takes a conscious effort to be with him. So do you relate to being a Martha? Are you doing more for Jesus than just simply being with him? And what might you need to change in order to make that time? One final question. 
What would this community look like if each of us made a conscious effort to be with Jesus over doing stuff for him? I believe that we would be a community who continues to become more and more conformed to his, to his image. Wherever we find ourselves, then we, we will be a pleasant aroma to those who don't know the Lord. We will find ourselves acting like him at work, at our home, with our children, with our spouses, our coworkers. And our love for one another, for our brothers and sisters, would continue to be a light to those who don't know Jesus. And now, speaking, spending time with Jesus, we're going to take time right now to partake in communion during this last time of worship. If you're a visitor here with us, and you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, please feel free to partake with us. But if you are new, or you do not consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, we do ask that you refrain from partaking in the Lord's table. We believe this to be a practice that is shared among believers. And when we do this, we are reminding ourselves of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. We are reminding ourselves of the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, which has literally become our life. So, take this in the following time of worship as an opportunity to come to the Lord. Practice these things that I've talked about right now, right now in the worship time. Spend time with him. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for today. God, thank you for the gift of life that you have imparted to each and every one of us as we are here. God, thank you that you've given us your word, that you want to have a relationship with us. And that you want to have a relationship with us so much that you have given us your word and it's you communicating to us. Now, Father, as we spend time in worship, I pray that we would view this time as us communicating to you as us spending time with you. God, that wherever we find ourselves, especially if we're anxious or worried or concerned, God, that we would make the choice not to worry, that we would give thanks for everything you've done, and that we would also bring our cares, our anxieties, and our concerns to you. I pray that as we go throughout our week, God, that we would want to be conformed to your image. And we know that to be conformed to your image is to sit at your feet. So help us to do that, we pray. We come to you in your son's name, we all said, amen.